All right, so today I thought I would give you guys a little tour. Um, this is actually, uh, this is my part of my yard. This is a prairie. And I didn't install this, although I wanted to install something like this if I had a yard that was large enough to do it with. Um, but this is, this is a prairie, and it's been going for, I think, close to 10 years. Um, it was actually started by uh, the people who we bought the house from, which is pretty cool. So I thought I'd give you guys a little tour and look at um, some of the species that are here. Now notice um, some of the houses around here, of course, have normal lawns. Hasn't really caught on yet, um, but we're working on it. So one of the flowers that is blooming right now, now this is what we call a DYC. This is a damn yellow composite. So composite flowers, of course, are made of, and if you've seen my video about the structure of uh, Asteraceae, this is not one flower. This is actually lots of separate flowers. If I pull here, right there, that's one flower. If you look very closely, you can see that little hairs right there, except it's not a hair. little thing that looks like a hair that's a stigma and a style and that little brown thing at the bottom is a separate fruit that's an akeen so all the members of the aster ac have this so this one i'm pretty sure but i'm not 100 percent sure i'm pretty sure this is a heliopsis helianthoides and it looks a lot like a sunflower helianthus um, but these guys have chaff. So chaff are these little things that are next to the flowers. So these are the disc flowers. I pulled off earlier a ray flower. Let's see if I can pull off some chaff for you. All right, so on the left side is the actual flower. On the right side is a chaffy bract. So there's a little bract around it. Um, and that's basically at the base of the flower. And that's one of the defining characteristics you can separate um, large groups of the Aster AC. So the other thing you can use are these guys back here. These are called filleries. And if you've ever eaten an artichoke, um, this is actually what you spend most of your time eating. Um, but these are another type of bract that are kind of all fused together. And that can help you um, identify members of the Aster AC, especially these uh, DYCs, which unfortunately they're called that because they all look alike and they can be very difficult to identify. Um, but this guy's got opposite leaves and I'm pretty sure it is Heliopsis helianthoides rather than something else. Uh, this guy right here, notice it's not flowering. And I say, how can you tell? So if you look here, notice the stem is square, got opposite leaves. If I touch them, and smell them. They have a nice fragrance. That's a member of the mint family. That's Monarda fistulosa. Then over here, and these guys are not flowering. My kids have the um, temerity. They like to say, oh, it's dead. And I said, no, these are the seeds. And specifically, since this is another member of the Asteraceae, these are the fruits. And what we've gotten a lot of here, these are the dead flowers and the fruits that are left. So we've gotten a lot of goldfinches coming around. Gotten a lot of goldfinches coming in and eating the mature fruits. All right, so here, this is a plant that's not supposed to be here. This is uh, red clover, trifolium. Uh, it was probably planted by somebody back when this was a pasture um, and it's just kind of hung around and not really gone away. Uh, it kind of comes and goes. Uh, this year it's pretty, it's pretty intense, but it's not always here a lot. So right here, this is, of course, one of the more familiar plants and kind of a weedy, another non-native. This is Queen Anne's Lace. Uh, basically wild carrot, Daucus carota. So you pull them up. You look at the root. 
Pull them up and look at the root. That's a wild carrot. It smells like carrot. Now, I wouldn't recommend eating them necessarily because there are a lot of very similar species um, that are very, very toxic and will kill you. So you have to really know what you're doing um, to eat members of the carrot family, the APACE. Um, over here, let's see what else do we have over here. Right here, these are actually last year's flowering stalks. This is of little blue stem, uh, Schizacrium scoparium. So these guys will be coming up to flower. I'll see if I can find some some of this year's flower stalks. This is something else that should not be here. Um, this is Cerisi lespediza. This is actually the common name. Uh, scientific name is Lespediza cuneata. So this is from Asia. It was promoted as a um, as a forage plant. So again, this is probably from when it was a pasture. And unfortunately, it's very fire adapted and does really well in these prairies. So I basically have to come in here um, and use chemicals to get rid of them. Let's see if I can pull them out. Nope, I'm gonna have to come back and treat that. So over here we have Salvia, Salvia azuria. So this is another member of the mint family. So if you look here, it's again kind of got that square stem. Um, it's not especially fragrant, um, but it is quite beautiful. Usually when you see the blue like this, this is going to be pollinated by bees. So Salvia azuria. So this larger plant right here, this is a Baptisia. These are the seed pods. And these are actually legumes, although you definitely would not want to eat them because they are toxic. But that's the legume split open. So this is actually Baptisia australis. It's a little bit harder to tell um, the Baptisia australis. We also have um, a couple of other species of Baptisia, but these are usually long and pointy. Um, it's not super common in the wild, but it's pretty common in plantings um, and horticultural installations because it's very it's very showy um, but it's a neat species to have and the hummingbirds love it and the bees love it and it's just great okay so here is side oats blue grandma and this is one of my favorite grasses because it produces these really bright orange red stamens and you can even see the stigmas there if you're careful see those little white feathery things those are grass flowers and grasses, unfortunately, can be really hard to identify, but this particular species is pretty easy because it holds its spikelets in this kind of offside, all on one side type of way, and it's got those really obvious um, orange stamens. So, like I said, it's a little bit uh, found more commonly farther west, um, but it does show up in plantings and occasionally in the wild here in Missouri. All right, so this is one of my favorite flowers. Um, previous owner told me all about it and basically said it was out here. I think this is actually a new one from one I haven't seen before. So this is, it's a little bit sticky. It's a member of the carnation family, the Caryophyllaceae, and they have these bent um, petals and usually they have these little end pieces like here. It's also known as the pink family and a lot of times the ends of the petals will actually have little cuts in them like pinking shears. Um, but these are, as you might guess, from being so bright red, these are beloved by hummingbirds, and our hummingbirds are just crazy over them. Uh, but it's a really sticky plant. So right around the flowers is really sticky. It probably discourages ants and things. So this is a tiny little plant, um, obviously. This is Tephrosia virginica. This is um, goat's rue. And I actually got, it's got a flag next to it because this is one I actually planted. So I'm hoping... In the next couple of years, it will um, come up and flower, but it's one of the ones that I've seen um, in native prairies around here, and I'm really excited to have it. Now, prairies a lot of times are defined by grasses, and a lot of people have trouble identifying grasses pretty much unless they're actually actively flowering. Um, but this one is, I've learned to identify, it's relatively easy. Notice right here, it's got this little thing right here right next to where the leaf blade attaches um, to the stem, or at least is sheathed around the stem, I should say. And that's called an oracle. And this particular grass is a really crazy long oracle. And it's kind of blue-green in color. 
This is um, Indian grass or Sorgastrum natans, and it blooms really, really late in the year. So if you're trying to identify, it can be a little bit tricky. Um, but that oracle and um, the sheath can kind of help you identify. I hear a hummingbird. Yep, they're after the uh, they're after the Silene, the royal catchfly. Oh, there is a goldfinch. So if you're out on the prairie, even if it's just your front yard, which this is only about, I don't know, maybe an acre-ish, even less than that, you can enjoy all kinds of birds and bugs and cool stuff. This is big blue stem, and it's still not even at its full height, so Androp Andropogon gerardi. Oh, there's the hummingbird. This is um, big blue stem, and it can get something like six feet tall, but it dies back to the ground every year. Those are the stamens that are falling out. But anyway, you can identify the Andropogon gerardi. People talk about it kind of having, it looks a little bit like a turkey foot. I mean, really, they usually have um, more like five rather than three, and they kind of have this really long group of spikelets that hang out together. So if you can kind of see that, that's classic prairie is something like that against the sky. See here. This is Echinacea. This is Echinacea purpurea probably. Maybe I planted this out here? I didn't think there was any when I first came here, but it's not, it's another one of these species that's not super common in the wild, but it does really well in cultivation and has a tendency to just kind of take over when it's in cultivation. Probably not in the middle of this prairie, um, but it's a beautiful plant. Great to have in your garden. It's really, really awesome. Okay, so right here, this is another grass. One of the big grasses, and it may look kind of generic, but I'm pretty sure this is Panicum virgatum. This is switch switchgrass, and this is one that's thought to people have been really excited about it for forage, um, for uh, biofuels, that kind of thing. They all have kind of this really branchy uh, group of spikelets all together. And again, if we look carefully, we might be able to see. There's a few stamens in there. Eh, not quite. So here's a different spot in the prairie. And this has a lot of this species. This is Aryngium yuccifolium. And it's actually a member of the APAC, the carrot family, even though it really doesn't look like one. It doesn't have the typical um, compound umbel. But you can see where the specific epithet comes from. Yucca folium, the leaves look a lot like a yucca, and they do actually have some pretty strong fibers. You can actually use them. They've been used by native people. Uh, they found actually shoes made from them in a rock shelter um, from several thousand years ago, and I actually made a little bit of rope with them, so they're, they're kind of a useful plant that way. Um, they're very much beloved by a lot of pollinators, um, but their flowers are super, they're super hard and tough. They've got lots of nice stamens in there, and it's probably compound umbel that's basically just been shrunk up into this, what looks basically like a head inflorescence, even though it's not technically the same as the Asteraceae version. Here I can show you one of the other grasses. This right here is very often planted ornamentally. This is a, this is a grass called prairie drop seed, and it just forms these nice little clumps. It doesn't get super tall. Um, it's rare that I actually even seen, see it putting up flower spikes, um, but it's a really neat grass, and I've seen it used in formal settings, so it's a really, really useful one to have around, really nice one. All right, so right here, this is known as wild quinine, which I'm not sure that it actually has um, the compound in question, 
um, but this is Parthenium integrifolium, and it is a member of the Aster family, which is kind of hard to tell, but basically these are the head inflorescences. It's basically finished blooming pretty much, so if I were to rip these open, I would mostly be finding um, fruits. You can see the plant's got these big, thick, heavy leaves, and if you just see the leaves, it looks a little bit like... Um, Compass, uh, excuse me, Sylphium terbenthanaceum, which unfortunately I really don't have very much of. It's a very quintessential prairie plant, um, but I don't have too much of it. Over here, we have mimosa, which again is an invasive species. And a lot of people like the trees, but I really hate them because they seed pretty much everywhere and then I have to come in and kill them. So not one of my favorite trees. The things I have here is this Vernonia ironweed. It's another member of the Asteraceae. It's a little easier because it's purple. Um, although the Vernonians are difficult to separate the species, so it's probably Baldwin eye because it gets pretty large. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I'll probably have to go back and check just to make sure which of the ironweeds it is. But the butterflies just love this thing. So this is Monarda fistulosa. Again, this is a member of the mint family. You can tell it's got these two lipped fused petal flowers and it's got the nice fragrance and then it's got opposite leaves yeah, that's the square stem you can tell that it's square so right here and not many, many other places in the prairie so right here we've got this is verbicina helianthoides also known as wing stem so this is the wing stem that looks most like a sunflower. And when it's blooming, it kind of looks like uh, a lot of other DYCs. But these right here, these are the wing part, part of the stem, which is really kind of cool. And supposedly, although I haven't seen it on mine, um, they make frost flowers. So basically when it's in the fall and you get a sudden freeze, uh, the water inside the plant will actually come out and make this really crazy design. Another of what I've got a lot of here this is the gray-headed coneflower, so this is Radibidia pinata. And this is after it's finished blooming. There's one over there that's still blooming. At least it's still got some ray flowers that have some color on them. And this was just really, really abundant um, earlier in the season, but it's just, right now, it's just not the best time for it. But, as we saw earlier, the goldfinches like it, so... Glad to see them. It's a good, good species for wildlife. I would argue no prairies complete without milkweeds. Now right here, this one's kind of boring. This is common milkweed. You can tell it because it's usually got um, these super spiky things on the fruits. That's the follicle. All right, so this guy right here, this is um, Asclepius tuberosa or butterfly weed, or butterfly milkweed, depending on who you're talking to. Um, there's actually quite a bit of it out here, but it has a tendency to kind of blend in, except when it's producing pods, or when it's producing flowers. When it's producing flowers, it's just, it's really amazing. Bright orange, um, very, very showy. And beloved by pretty much most pollinators, too. So this is another one of the prairie species that I have. This is Baptisia alba. And basically it's almost the same as the um, Baptisia australis, except um, it produces white flowers and it blooms a little bit later. So it's another one that's highly loved by bees, but it's been done blooming for a little while, so it's producing seed now. Oh, apparently not all of the Baptisia alba is done blooming. So here's one right here. Now most of them are in big seed pods like this, but not all of them. I hope you enjoyed taking a look at the uh, 
at my uh, constructed prairie and basically it just has a mowed edge so we don't have to do a whole lot of maintenance and the hummingbird is back so it's really great we get lots of pollinators hummingbird likes to visit us because of the silene let's plant lots of silene what can i say kill your lawn and put in a nice prairie